Jerusalem is always in the news and a center of dispute for the whole world. But that's not what's going to make the biggest headlines. The real shock comes when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this city. And is it about to happen? That's what we'll explore right now. In the background is the Mount of Olives, the vicinity where Jesus ascended to heaven 40 days after his resurrection. And this is the very place where he'll return. Geologists describe the area as a fault line attached to the Great Rift Valley, which runs all the way to East Africa. The prophet Zechariah spells it out very plainly concerning Messiah in the last days. In chapter 14 and verse 4, he says that his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. A great shaking is coming to one of the most beautiful holy spots in all the world because it's to this very mountain, the blessed Mount of Olives, that Jesus has promised he will return. Outside of the Galilee, the Mount of Olives was the main place where the Lord shared great revelations with his followers about the kingdom of God and the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The Mount of Olives is so very special to me, I'll never forget, on our very first trip to Jerusalem in 1975, my husband and I spent our first night in a Mount of Olives hotel, and we woke up to the unforgettable, spectacular sight of the Temple Mount in the bright light of day, absolutely resplendent, one of the thrilling experiences of my life. You really feel the presence of Jesus everywhere in the Holy Land, and especially on the Mount of Olives, because it was on this mountain that Jesus often chose to teach his disciples. And here he preached his sermon or his briefing known as the Little Apocalypse, or sometimes it's called the Olivet Discourse. The Little Apocalypse is a passage found in the Gospels of Mark chapter 13, Matthew 24 and 25, and Luke chapter 21. It's known as the Little Apocalypse because the briefing included the Lord's specific descriptions of the end times. The Olivet Discourse establishes the timeline regarding the second coming of Messiah. The other writers in the New Testament, the apostles Peter, John, and Paul, supplement and substantiate the information that the Lord himself establishes in the Olivet Discourse. Yeshua, that's Jesus' name in Hebrew, use apocalyptic references and language from the Hebrew scriptures. The first major point he made in his Olivet Discourse was to take heed that no man deceive you. This was his command, so we want to be prayerfully aware, always to guard against deception. And the best way to do that is to know his word thoroughly versus the opinions of men. Now, according to the account in Matthew 24, Jesus was in the area of the temple complex, which is also behind me, where the Dome of the Rock presently sits. And his disciples called his attention to the temple buildings. Do you see all of these things? Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, not one stone will be left on top of the other. Every one will be thrown down. Well, I'm sure the disciples were greatly astonished and perplexed by the Lord's severe words because to them, the Jewish temple was absolutely central. His disciples had pointed out the grandeur of Herod's temple, which was about 10 stories high, and it was adorned with gold, silver, and other precious metals. However, and shockingly, 
Jesus predicted that this magnificent monumental building would be reduced to rubble. Very soon after this, the disciples came to him privately as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. Tell us, they said anxiously, when will the temple be destroyed and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Again, I remind you, the first thing Jesus answered was, watch out that no one deceives you. Because he said many would come in his name claiming to be Messiah and will deceive many after him. Then he said, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but don't be alarmed. These things must happen, but the end is still to come. So Jesus began his briefing by listing wars and rumors of wars and false Christs, but the end is not yet. Then he continued in Matthew 24 and verse 7, that nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. He listed famines and earthquakes in various places. All these, he said, are the beginning of birth pains. You see, the Lord likened the troubles of the end times to a woman in childbirth. And as somebody who's given birth twice, I can surely testify that labor pains definitely increase in magnitude, intensity, and timing, coming closer together with greater intensity. Then Jesus said, you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. He said, many will turn away from the faith and hatefully betray one another, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, people's love will grow cold. But, he said, the believers who stand firm to the end will be saved. That throws some light on the once saved, always saved doctrine, doesn't it? Jesus said we must stand firm to the end in order to be saved. And then he added a big activity to his timeline that I'm sure his disciples weren't expecting because they were expecting a quicker line of events. Jesus dropped a bombshell into their minds by saying, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Wow, the whole world must hear the gospel first? That would take some considerable amount of time. That was quite an assignment. And yes, it's taken us nearly 2,000 years to reach the world. And yet there are still some remote tribes who've never heard the gospel. But most nations have at least had a gospel witness at some point in time, whether it's been through the efforts of missionaries, Bible translators, or through the amazing broadcast media of more recent times. The disciples most likely assumed that the end of the world and the destruction of the temple would occur at about the same time. But Yeshua sought to correct that impression, first by discussing the coming invasion of Jerusalem by by what would be the Romans. And then he described his second coming to render universal judgment. But in between, in between the temple's destruction and his second coming, They, his disciples, must work. They would be expected to preach his gospel throughout all the world. Now, turning to Matthew 14, no, turning to Matthew 24 and verse 15, I want to read a key statement of Jesus. And I dare say most people haven't got a clue what he was talking about or referring to. But the disciples, as most Jews in his day, were at least familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures. He said, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, mentioned by the prophet Daniel, and here the gospel writers insert, let the reader understand. Then Jesus said, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of his house. 
Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. Jesus said how dreadful it'll be on those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. According to Bible teacher Chuck Missler, Jesus saves us hours of boring library research by authenticating the authorship of Daniel to that apocalyptic book of Daniel in the Hebrew Scriptures. Jesus' references, in fact, are to two passages, Daniel 9 and verse 27 and Daniel eleven thirty one, 31, concerning the abomination of desolation. And what is that? Jesus referred to a key historical event. The rabbis explained that the expression, abomination of desolation, refers to the desecration of the second temple, also known as Herod's temple, by the erection of an idol of Zeus. This desecration of the temple by Antiochus Epiphanes had occurred two centuries before and was a well-known historical event to every Jew. And the subsequent rededication of the temple is still celebrated every year at Hanukkah, which is also called the Feast of Dedication. And that's even mentioned in John chapter 10 and verse 22. So the abomination refers to an idol that was set up in the Holy of Holies in the temple. But here in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus indicates that a similar desecration will happen again and that it will usher in a period called the Great Tribulation. Now concerning his Olivet briefing and the topic of the abomination of desolation, both the Gospels of Matthew and Mark add the phrase, let the reader understand. In other words, we must pay special attention. We must study and dig because this is the time that the prophet Daniel said that the books would be unsealed. Speaking of the future, Jesus said the abomination of desolation will stand where it should not stand in the holy place. And after Jesus described the abomination, he warned that the people living at that time in Judea, here in the Holy Land, should flee to the mountains so quickly that they shouldn't even try to collect anything from their homes for the journey. Jesus also said believers should pray that this would not happen in winter or on the Sabbath when fleeing would be even more difficult. Why? That's because Orthodox Jews are limited by how far they can walk on the Sabbath day. For example, on the Mount of Olives, there are Sabbath wires stretched out on poles. These are markers that restrict how far an Orthodox Jew can actually walk on the Sabbath. They cannot walk beyond the wires on the poles. And that's why Jesus made the point that we should pray that the Jews don't have to flee from the abomination on a Sabbath or in the winter time when there are dangerous flash floods in the desert through which the Jews will have to pass to get to the mountains, possibly to Petra in modern-day Jordan. Jesus described this as a time of great tribulation, worse than anything in history. His Olivet Discourse makes it clear that when the Lord returns, it will be to a Jewish Jerusalem. That's because he said, See, your house is going to be left to you desolate, for you will not see me again until you're able to say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Therefore, he says, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, or in this case, let the viewer, let the listener understand. Then let those, Jesus said, who are in Judea flee to the mountains and pray that your journey it will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. This warning against having to flee on the Sabbath assumes that Jerusalem will be, in fact, under Jewish control and under Jewish regulations. Because today... 
Jerusalem is under Jewish control and there are regulations in place that forbid much commerce and travel. Only under a Jewish government would this be a problem. Now let's jump over to Luke's Olivet Discourse and the Gospel of Luke chapter 21 and verse 24 because important extra details are given. Jesus said that the Jews would fall by the edge of the sword and they'd be led away captive into all nations. And he said, Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles under the feet of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In that one verse, nearly 2,000 years of Jewish history have been covered. Luke 21, 24 was fulfilled throughout the diaspora because the Jews were taken and dispersed into all the nations. And it was fulfilled in the Six Days War in June of 1967 because that's when Jerusalem was no longer under the feet or under the control of Gentile nations but came back into Jewish hands. That means we're living in an extended period of grace. In a sense, we're living on borrowed time because the times of the Gentiles have been technically fulfilled, although the sovereignty of Jerusalem is still in question by the nations. Well, Jesus continued in Luke 21, 25 that he said, there will be signs in the sun, moon and stars. And on the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. Well, that's a description of tsunamis, isn't it? He said people will faint from terror. They'll be apprehensive of what's coming on the world, for even the heavenly bodies will be shaken. But at that time, the people on earth will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Yes, he's coming on a cloud again, just as he left the Mount of Olives in the clouds. But a greater glory will accompany his second coming. He said, when these things begin to take place, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Truly I tell you, Jesus added, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. Then the Lord gives us this warning. Be careful. Don't allow your hearts to be weighed down with drunkenness and the anxieties of life so that my day will close in on you suddenly like a trap, like a thief. But always be on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you will be able to stand before the Son of Man. Well, if you've joined the program late, I'm Christine Dark, and we're studying what's called the Little Apocalypse, also called the Olivet Discourse, Jesus' end-time private briefing to his disciples that took place on the Mount of Olives. And thus, that's the scene behind me. The Lord's Olivet Discourse occurred just before the anointing of Jesus in Bethany, which is located on the other side of the Mount of Olives. The setting for the Olivet Discourse is thought to have been deliberate because Jesus knew the scroll of the prophet Zechariah, referring to the location where Messiah will place his feet in the last days on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 4.14. So he liked putting his feet here often. Now a major challenge to theologians is to determine the timing of the fulfillment of Bible prophecies. For example, the great tribulation that Jesus described, is it a past or a future event? In each of the three gospel accounts, the Olivet Briefing contains a number of statements which seem predictive of future events. While there's no dispute that Jesus prophesied about the destruction of the temple, However, there are diverse opinions concerning the fulfillment of the other content of the Olivet Discourse. One view is called preterism, meaning that all of these predictions were fulfilled by the time Jerusalem fell in 70 AD to the Roman army and 
General Titus. Therefore, there's a category of scholars referred to as preterists who argue that basically the whole Olivet Discourse dealt with the historical period around 70 AD, and so they attach little relevance to any future fulfillment. On the other hand, the futurists argue that the Olivet Discourse is largely prophetic, with only a small portion referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Well, I'm a futurist and not a preterist. After all, many theologians concede that Bible prophecies can have more than one fulfillment. I'm of the school that believes these prophecies of Jesus were partially fulfilled in 70 AD, and they continue to be fulfilled and to unfold due to the fact of the miracle of the regathering of the Jewish people in the reconstituted state of Israel. Just as the abomination of desolation occurred in the past, it will occur again in the future rebuilt temple. Some Christian theologians believe the great tribulation of Bible prophecy already occurred during the first century as God's judgment upon Israel for having rejected the Messiah. But other theologians hold to the view that the great tribulation is yet a future event necessary to pressure and to humble and to prepare Israel to receive the Messiah. Most believers are asking, when will Jesus return? In the Olivet Discourse or the Little Apocalypse, Jesus disclosed that immediately after end times called the tribulation, people would see a sign. The sun, he said, will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. His statements about the shaking of the heavenly sound quite apocalyptic. But they appear to be a quote from the scroll of Isaiah, chapter 13 and verse 10, which predicts the stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising moon will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. Also, the prophet Joel predicted heavenly signs like blood-red moons before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And blood-red moons have been frequented more and more. The judgments upon earth involve catastrophes that literally will affect the stellar universe and impact the entire planet. My friends, this world is rapidly racing towards the time of the return of the Lord to reign in Jerusalem. And that's why Jerusalem is always in the news. All the predictions of Scripture and all the developments of current history combine to focus our attention on one impending event of unique importance, and that's the return of the Lord Jesus in power and great glory. We as a ministry have been faithfully holding prayer meetings and evangelistic outreaches on the Mount of Olives for two decades in anticipation of Zechariah 14.4. And in that date, His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Our first ministry center in Jerusalem was on the Mount of Olives. And for many years, we had a TV camera on the Mount of Olives watching end time events. So as an end time watchman, I can tell you faithfully that soon the Bible says, God will intervene and judge all the nations on the basis of the way they have treated Israel. In Joel chapter 3 verses 1 to 2, God declares, For behold, the days and in that time when I will bring back the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And there I will enter into judgment with them on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. And because they have divided, they have parted, they have partitioned my land. God's purpose is to make the city Jerusalem a source of blessing to all nations. But he promises severe judgment on all who oppose him in Jerusalem. 
Are you ready for the coming of the Lord, for that great and glorious day when His feet will stand again on the Mount of Olives, that glorious scene behind me? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you also ready for when the Lord comes as a thief in the night to take His bride, the true believers, to the marriage supper of the Lamb? That's called in the Bible the snatching away or the rapture. In his private Olivet briefing in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus warned his people that at his second coming, some would be asleep. He used the parable of a wedding and of the bridegroom coming at midnight for his bride. But the foolish versions in the parable were left behind. If you're wise, you won't be left behind because this world will become the domain for a short period of time of the Machiavellian figure called Antichrist who will set up an idol, the abomination of desolation, in the temple soon to be rebuilt. There have always been Antichrists in this world, but the final Antichrist will require all people to take a number and to give unswerving loyalty, the consequence of which will be eternal damnation. So this is the hour to believe the good news that God sent Jesus to save us from God's wrath. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the Bible says you shall be saved. That's the good news of the Bible. Give your heart and your allegiance to Jesus now. Well, thank you for joining us in this Bible study. If you'd like to watch it again or any of our programs, they are available 24-7 at our website, exploits.tv. And when you visit our website, you can ask for our free magazine called Exploits. And you can find me on Facebook or Twitter for a chat. And so until next time, I'm Christine Dark, reminding you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Shalom.